How Racism Affects Health. Dr. Anya Noram is a family doctor and a public health and preventative medicine specialist at the Taibu Community Health Centre in Toronto. She is also the Associate Program Director of the Public Health and Preventative Medicine Residency Program at the University of Toronto, where she recently took on the position as the Black Health team, uh, Theme Lead for the Faculty of Medicine, incorporated black Canadian health issues into the medical school curriculum. Dr. Anya Noram. Thank you. Can you hear me? You can hear me. Bonsoir tout le monde. Thank you for having me here. Uh, so I would like to, it's working great. I would like to start uh, my, my talk with a land acknowledgement. Of course, very grateful to uh, Elder uh, Verna for the land acknowledgement that she gave. I also want to acknowledge uh, that here in Gatineau, we are an unceded traditional Algonquin territory. And it is and still is the home to many indigenous people here in this region. And I am grateful. Uh, to have the opportunity to present in this territory. Let me see if I can adjust this. That's better. Okay. Uh, and I am also uh, very much grateful uh, to Indigenous scholars, uh, healthcare workers, and communities for um, giving meaning to terms like intergenerational trauma, uh, to cultural safety and advocating for recognition of racism as a social determinant of health because that greatly informs my own work. I'm also very grateful to the organizers uh, today for inviting me here and I'm grateful to all of you for coming uh, here and yes, I got a shout out in the back. So. <laughs> Um, and also, I'd like to congratulate uh, the midwives of Ontario who are leading the way for midwives, midwives across Canada in the pay equity battle. So, congratulations. Yes. 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 So congratulations for that victory. I understand it's still ongoing, but hopefully we will see that change happen across Canada and uh, potentially in, in so many other uh, regions as far as you know, different uh, regions being um, inspired. So the next thing I'd like to do, I know it's late in the evening and I really wanted to get everybody um, engaged because we're going to have a kind of a difficult conversation about a topic we don't like to talk about here in Canada, which is racism, right? So, um, so I thought, you know, uh, I was reflecting, I, I think I'd like to try this, this is the first time I'm doing it. It's a traditional African roll call that I'm going to try, it's the first time. Uh, my father is Nigerian and uh, growing up in the Nigerian community uh, in Montreal, uh, I would see uh, our elders uh, do this and it was really a way of engaging uh, community and making sure that everybody was there and present uh, and ready to be uh, a collective, ready to be in solidarity. So we'll, we'll try it out. Bear with me, it's the first, like I said, it's the first time I'm doing it, but, uh, but I saw it many times. So basically the way it goes is I would call the name of a group or, um, or a city or a town, and then um, after calling that group, I would say the words kwenu. And kwenu in my language, Igbo, uh, means, you know, are you here as a collective? Are you here and present in solidarity? And so it actually incorporates quite a bit of intersectionality because you can say um, yes to all of the groups that you identify with. And the way that you say, yes, I'm here is actually really simple. You go, hey, okay? <laughs> like, yeah, all right? Uh, so uh, for example, if I were to say, Gatino, Kwenu. There we go, okay. So let's, let's try this out. So that was a rehearsal, so get ready, <laughs> okay? So Gatino, Kwenu. Yay! All right. Um, people of the Algonquin Territory, Quenu. <laughs> All right. Quebec, Quenu. All right. Canada, Quenu. Africa, Quenu. All right. <laughs> Midwives, Quenu. Citizens of this world, Quenu. All right, all right, so I think we're ready to begin. <laughs> <laughs> 
So as I said, this is gonna get uncomfortable, okay? But I thought it was really important for us to have a moment as a collective because the, this issue and discussing it uh, and, and really addressing it will require us uh, as, as Canadians and citizens of the world to be a collective and to act in solidarity. And so uh, I do give this disclaimer because, uh, and this is a quote from uh, James Baldwin, an African-American author in the United States. Um, and so he said, not everything that is fake can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And so the things I'm about to say are actually probably going to make everyone at some point, uh, regardless of race, very uncomfortable. Uh, but these are important conversations that we have to have in order to uh, have change. So an outline of the journey I'm going to take you through, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background about me and also why this issue is very important, uh, particularly just right across Canada, and then I'll get into systemic, systemic racism and how it affects general health, and I'll zoom in a little bit on maternal health, and then talk about options for what we can do. So we'll go into some background here. So just to tell you a little bit about me, so that's my picture, I'm like nine years old there. Um, so growing up in Montreal, as far back as I can remember, I've always been interested in the topic of racism and advocating about it. Um, really, um, from the first time that I experienced racism as a six-year-old being called the N-word and experiencing social exclusion. And the way that I uh, managed this or dealt with this was to uh, read and learn and share with people uh, the importance, and by people I mean like grade two students, <laughs> what racism was and how to fight it. <laughs> so you can actually see on the far right here, it's um, a picture of the African National Congress flag in South Africa that was fighting for apartheid at the time, and it's, it's colored in crayon, okay? <laughs> so, so I really thought that I was going to you know, be a freedom fighter like Nelson Mandela or a lawyer. As it turned out, I, I became a physician and a public health physician. So, you know, that's a story for another day. But what's interesting for me is it's actually come full circle because in my work, um, I've now learned that racism is not just a social justice issue, but it's also a health issue. So, and you know, it's not just my opinion, it's starting to gain ground um, here in Canada. So certainly in the United States, it's widely recognized, uh, but in Canada, um, less so, but we're seeing uh, healthcare leaders in, in Canada really uh, speak out about this issue. So this is a quote from Dr. Gary Newton, who's president and CEO of the Mount Sinai Hospital Health System uh, in Toronto. And so he says, um, he said at a conference, when we think of complex patients, we picture an aging population with multiple chronic diseases. It's important we all understand that inequity and racism are disease equivalents in terms of their impact. They contribute to complexity and poor outcomes in the same way diabetes and hypertension do. And so this is starting to get more and more recognition across Canada. And, and so in my next slide, I also just want to show that this will become a growing issue in Canada as we become more and more diverse. Now this is a very busy slide, you don't have to, to read all of the details in it, but it is a graph from Statistics Canada looking at diversity across Canada um, and projecting, so using the data from 2006 and projecting to the year 2031. And really all you have to take from this slide is the dark blue and the light blue. So the dark blue is um, the percentage of people who identify as visible minority group um, in Canada. Um, in 2006, and the light blue is what it's projected to be in 2031. So pretty much right across Canada, pretty much no matter where you're from, there's going to be essentially a doubling of, of people who are racialized um, in your region. Um, so on average, it's going to go from about 15% to 30% of, of Canadians. Uh, and this doesn't include Indigenous populations, but we know that the Indigenous population is increasing in Canada as well. So we are experiencing a great time of change, but also as healthcare providers, we need to rise to that challenge. Okay, so now we're going to get ready to talk about systemic racism and health. <coughs> So this is a diagram here that I use when I want to uh, describe how we go from how we go from social influences because we're social beings um, to poor health outcomes due to racism. Now, if you want to zoom out, really, what this what this diagram really represents is how our lived social experiences can affect our mental and physical health. <laughs> 
But specifically, I'm going to describe it in the context of racism, and I am going to use black Canadians as my case example. But a lot of this can be extrapolated to other uh, other groups and also other places and spaces where people experience social exclusion due to um, their, their, um, their social group that they identify with or have been classified as such by the dominant group. So for social influences, and I'll, we are, I'm going to show this quite a few times, so don't, don't worry if you can't uh, capture everything, it's okay, I'm gonna walk you through it and you'll see it quite a few times. But I'm gonna start with the social influences because we are social beings. And so, um, particularly I'll talk about uh, a little bit of our history in Canada, but whether it's history, religion, media, art, culture, we take in a lot of different um, opinions, influences, images, and so that does shape our perspectives about different groups, whether it's conscious or unconscious. So one of the things that I want to highlight within the context of history, I'm not going to give a, an elaborate history lesson, but in the context of history is really um, reminding us, particularly as healthcare providers, that race is a social construct, and it was constructed historically in our past. And so race is a socially constructed way of judging, classifying, and creating difference among people. Race is not biological, and it is not genetic. It is a classification used to create hierarchies between people based on phenotype based on what you look like, so your hair and your skin, that type of thing. And then we are making a lot of assumptions about disparities or, or different groups' um, inequities and assuming that it's biological. The European concept of race arose at the time of the scientific revolution, the age of European uh, imperialism and colonization and often was used to justify uh, the mistreatment of particular groups, deciding that some groups were inherently uh, superior to others. So today though, it can prevent us from looking for solution for socially driven inequalities uh, because we deceive ourselves in believing that the differences might be genetic or biological, despite a human genome uh, project that told us we are 99.9% .9 the same. This can be in conflict with a lot of the ways that many of us were taught. If you were taught about different groups, um, you largely learned about it in the biological model. So to help with that, I'd like to give a case example um, of a publication from a few years back, um, but it's a seminal article from the New England Journal of Medicine. So. Um, I'd like to use this to demonstrate how that assumption about biological differences can lead us to draw inaccurate and dangerous conclusions at times. So for decades, there were studies reporting that African American women were in the United States were more likely to have low birth weight infants compared to white Americans. And it was assumed that this difference was genetic. And so uh, Dr. David, who's a neonatologist, um, decided to do a study to, to uh, disprove that or sh demonstrate what he already knew. So um, him and his team used birth records from Illinois, um, hospitals in Illinois, to compare the distribution of birth weights among three groups. One was African American women, so African American women who were born and raised in the United States. West African immigrants, because they were the most likely group, that's kind of where the, the, uh, the gene pool or a lot of um, descendants in the United States have come from. They've come from West Africa via the transatlantic slave trade. So looking at West African um, immigrants who came to Illinois to have their babies and US born whites. And so this is the graph, this is the results of the distribution. And really the, the key message here is just look at the difference, how the, the red uh, section is quite different from the green and the purple. So in this graph, the red represents African American women. The green, oh, sorry, Afri the children born to African American uh, women. The green is babies born to African, West African immigrants. And the purple is white Americans. And so if the difference was genetic, you would actually expect the the green um, distribution to be quite far left, actually, because much of the African American population is mixed with European ancestry. But in fact, you see that the African immigrants and the white Americans have about the same size babies. The small babies are from uh, mothers who are born 
uh, who are African American whose mothers were born in the United States. And so this was a seminal article that challenged that, um, that assumption that the, genetic, the difference was genetic. As you can see here, the difference is not genetic. It is socially driven. And with future research, they were able to demonstrate that it is racially driven. The effects of racism can not only have an effect on um, a woman as she grows or a person as they grow, but also they reported could have a potential impact on generations to come. And so this was almost totally missed because of that history that I just talked about, that legacy of assuming that racial disparities are genetic rather than socially produced. And supports that, that thinking supports that racist ideology that some groups are genetically inferior. So we have to be really careful in healthcare when we make these assumptions. So now let's get into the core of the matter when we talk about racism, right? The actual ideology that asserts that one group is inherently superior to others. So this can occur at three different levels uh, based on the literature. So it can happen at the individual level, which is also known as the in, being um, internalized. So it can be internalized by the affected group, by the racialized group, so that they believe the stereotypes about their group. The interpersonal level is the one that you're probably most familiar with, and that's what we see in the media where somebody de does or says something racist to another person. But in this day and age, it's a lot more subtle than uh, a racial slur or a hate crime. Uh, often these are subtle microaggressions, everyday verbal, nonverbal, so like body language, uh, derogatory statements or insults based on race. And oftentimes, it is due to unconscious biases. And so these are biases that are actually not in line with a person's personal values. But because of those social influences that I talked about earlier, and I'll actually come back to a little later on, um, these can come out particularly when you have to have kind of a gut response, quick reaction to something. And so um, I'll come, the third level is the systemic level, but I'll come to that in a moment. But I thought we should just review interpersonal racism in Canada. So um, again, not very much talked about, but we are starting to have research here in Canada showing how common interpersonal racism is. And so uh, Dr. Arjuman Siddiqui, who's a professor at the Dalalana School of Public Health and one of my colleagues, published this study last year on race discrimination and risk for chronic disease in Canada. Uh, so this is from table one in her study. Um, and they used the 2013 cycle of the Canadian Community Health Survey, so that surveys people across Canada. And it focused on questions uh, related to experiences of discrimination. And as you can see, about 50% of blacks and indigenous people uh, in that CCHS study reported experiences of discrimination occurring more than once a year. And in fact, compared to other groups or all other groups, Aboriginal and black people reported the highest rates of discrimination. So that's, that's another myth that I hope I can dispel, that racism is not experienced by every group in the same way. It is experienced differently and to different extents, depending on, again, the history of that group, particularly here in North America. So as a key example, I'll use anti-black racism, but for any group, it's important to deconstruct the stereotypes. And for each group, there are reasons, historical reasons, economic reasons, why there might be stereotypes about them. So anti-black racism is a subset of racism similar to um, um, or analogous to uh, anti-Semitism, which is uh, racism against people of, of uh, Jewish uh, religion. So anti-black racism uh, is the, um, a subset of racism aimed at black people. And so I give you a de definition from the African Canadian Legal Clinic. Um, and so it is prejudice, attitudes, beliefs, stereotyping and discrimination that is directed at people of African descent and is rooted in their unique history and experience of enslavement. So here we come back to history, right? And so um, it plays out in our institutions and in many different ways, but for black people, whether or not they themselves are the descendants of slaves, actually, this, the stereotypes associated with that um, are, are um, associated with us based on, again, our phenotype. And so, what I try to help people understand about this is it's um, often it's an implicit biases, right? Again, not somebody's conscious values or anything that they would actually agree to or say that they believe. So the example that I, I try to give people 
is that of branding, right? So I have some in images up here, and whether you like these brands or not, you have certain. If you look at the Nike Swish, you're probably thinking running shoes, even if they make jackets and other things. There are just certain kind of gut responses that you will have to things based on a brand, because when people are looking to promote an issue or advertise something, you're going to be consuming that information, whether or not you believe in that brand or not. And so that's what I use when I'm talking about implicit biases associated with slavery. And so this is a very difficult slide, right? So if you're feeling uncomfortable, that's normal, but this is there's a reason that I'm showing this. And so on, the, um, on your far left, you see a sign saying Negroes for sale. And so this is from, you know, slavery ended in uh, the United States about 150 years ago. It ended here about 180 years ago. But you have to understand that for people, everyday people, to decide to own other people and to mistreat other people, it is really important to understand that they were not sociopaths. They were not monsters. They were everyday people who laughed and sang and had, had babies and, you know, went to funerals, everything. They were everyday people. And they had to sincerely believe for this business, this international business model to work, that people of African descent and other uh, groups were subhuman, less intelligent, not to be trusted and needed to be monitored. And so when you look over to the right in the present day, this is from a campaign from the city of Toronto um, where they're trying to bring attention to anti-black racism. They say, you know, quick. So it's that gut response and they use a white face and a black face. Rent to one, hire one. Um, this is only about three generations ago. There are people alive today who had a grandmother or somebody that they knew who was a slave. Right? So this branding follows people who look like me, whether or not, in fact, they are descendants of slaves. It's, it's actually irrelevant. It's that branding that has entered our culture, our history, uh, our literature, our media, and remains and has to do with the gut responses people might have, whether it's the police or whether it's in the emergency department or whether it's when you open the door or you're walking down uh, an alleyway by yourself. And so, as bad as what I had to say there was, um, actually, what I'm here to tell you is whether the racism occurs at the individual level or the interpersonal level, whether it is intentional or unintentional, those are just the symptoms of a bigger societal problem, which is systemic racism. Our systems, institutions, policies and work cultures were founded in this country on the belief that European appearance, customs, norms, behaviors, and standards were and are inherently superior. And so what that gives rise to is inequitable outcomes for particular groups, and it happens in multiple systems. And what you'll see at a population level is that it affects uh, population health regardless of whether somebody experienced uh, a racial slur or experienced a hate crime. So as health practitioners, we must begin to understand that systemic racism or institutionalized racism is the disease. Uh, the internalized and interpersonal forms are just the societal symptoms. And this is not about individuals. This is not about, I repeat, this is not about individuals. This is not about pointing fingers. This is not about intent. But the systems and structures that have created and maintained systemic racism. And this sets the stage for the poor social and health outcomes that I'll, I'll talk about on the right. And again, I want to point out that this is not just my opinion. This has been actually flagged by the United Nations, that systemic racism is a problem in our institutions, and echoed particularly with regards to anti-black racism by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. So to give a kind of concrete example of um, the systems and structures and how inequitable outcomes continue to happen for particular groups, I wanted to give you some concrete examples of systemic racism in our Canadian institutions, and I've put them under headings which are also the social determinants of health. Now there's a hesitance in Canada to collect race-based data, uh, but whenever it is collected by researchers or particular institutions, we're able to identify inequities. And so in this case, we'll look at systemic racism, particularly anti-black racism, but for all of these categories, I want to acknowledge that the situation often is similar or significantly uh, worse for indigenous nations. 
So for the child welfare system, in Ontario, we know that black children are 40% more likely than white children to be investigated. And with the exception of Aboriginal children, black children are more likely than any other ethno-racial group to be placed in foster care. For the educational system, uh, the work done by Toronto District School Board, because they collect race-based data, black students are twice as likely to drop out of school than their white peers. For a Canadian judicial system uh, and prison systems, uh, according to the published work of Dr. Akwasi Owosubempa on federal prisons, Aboriginal and black Canadians are grossly overrepresented in Canada's correctional institutions, and blacks at the time of the study were 2.5% of the general population, but 8.4% of the correctional population. Now, going into the labor market, this is where we really see the inequities because I think if somebody has the lens where you look at particular uh, groups um, and make assumptions about them, I feel like this one particularly helps dispel that, which is, um, and this was done here in Quebec. So, in a, a recent McGill University study using census data from 1996 to 2006, they reported that black persons in Montreal with a graduate degree had unemployment rate of 13.4% versus a non-black high school dropout. Well, what does that mean? That means that your odds of getting a job as a black graduate was about the same as a non-black person who had dropped out of high school. And I lived this because I grew up in Montreal. And I saw it happening around me, not as an adult, but as a child watching educated people um, working um, and cleaning offices. With regards to income in Canada, uh, a black person earns 75.6 cent, cents for every dollar a non-racialized person earns. Uh, and in this study, they actually controlled for immigration because that's part of the myth. So they looked even at second generation, they controlled for immigration, they controlled for age, and they controlled uh, for education. And nonetheless, that difference uh, persisted uh, for second generation and people born in Canada. Um, and another, although I'm focused on, um, on black population and systemic racism, uh, a study that I just read really um, caught my attention, I do feel is important to, to highlight this. So the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives um, has reported here in Canada that a university-educated Aboriginal worker makes 44% less than their non-Aboriginal peer in the private sector. So we certainly have a problem here in Canada with regards to our, our systems and structures. And in particular, I want to note, and I'd like you to, to kind of remember also, that it is very important to note that for all of these systems and structures, uh, adolescence is particularly a vulnerable time. It's a vulnerable time for anybody. You remember being a teenager, right? Being a teenager is not easy, or if you have teenagers, then prayers with you, right? Um, teenage years are difficult, okay? Um, but it's already difficult to be a teenager, but for black youth or indigenous youth, um, they may be interacting with all of these systems all at the same time. And if it's a, a young woman who's pregnant, then she's also interacting with systemic racism potentially in the healthcare system. Okay. So now everything I've told you was so far was to show you how these factors set the stage for poor social and health outcomes, which are described on the right here. So with regards to the outcomes, I describe them as direct and indirect. So the two groups. And we'll d dive into this a little bit before we go on to maternal health. And so for the direct outcomes, there is a growing body of evidence that I'll show you demonstrating racism as a chronic stressor having an effect on people's mental and physical health, regardless of their socioeconomic status. And then there's the indirect category, which I'll delve into, which is essentially uh, where um, uh, race uh, plays a role in somebody's socioeconomic status. And we know that poverty is a, a social determinant of health. So going into the mental health piece uh, briefly, uh, it's really important to understand that um, experiences of racism are traumatic, particularly for children. And so uh, 
poverty, and so it's been recognized by bodies, particularly in the United States, um, so in particular the Center for Healthcare Strategies in the United States, that poverty or systemic racism are considered forms of trauma because these are all adverse experiences which increase a person's lifelong potential for serious health problems, but also engaging in health risk behaviors. And I would also add feeling unsafe in healthcare settings that are culturally unsafe. And so uh, race-based stress or trauma, again, can occur in many different ways, and it doesn't have to be an interpersonal event that happened. Um, in particular, I want to draw your, your attention to institutional racism being a factor that can uh, cause trauma and have an impact on uh, mental health, uh, and just the constant, constant threat of racial discrimination. And so uh, this is a diagram from a meta-analytic review by researchers at Duke University who analyzed 134 papers on the health effects of discrimination uh, so not just racism, but discrimination in general, and proposed this pathway. Um, and so they concluded, based on all of those studies, that perceived discrimination causes poor health outcomes through two pathways. So one is where discrimination acts as a chronic stressor, so that's the one going to the top, which leads to a heightened stress response. This is an increase in cortisol levels. This is just constantly being in a fight or flight state. And so you can have an increase in chronic conditions like hypertension. And then the other pathway is through developing poor coping mechanisms to deal with the chronic stress of racism. So people might smoke or drink or overeat uh, just to cope. Or even if they don't engage in those behaviors, just living with um, systemic racism and everyday microaggressions is very exhausting. And so they might be too exhausted to engage in health, like healthy behaviors, like exercise. And so um, also, this wasn't part of the study, but in my opinion, um, it also can cause um, people to delay care because of their, um, their past experiences of racism or feeling culturally unsafe in healthcare settings. <coughs> So this is another nice diagram if you're more visual, but it's essentially saying uh, the same thing. So um, at the top you see environmental stressors, so those are the everyday things. Sometimes people have major life events or trauma or abuse, but it ends up being perceived as stress in the mind, and then one can have a physiologic response. And so that, over time, is known as the allostatic load, right? The physiologic response, and it can be measured. So allostatic load is the term that describes the wear and tear on the body that it accumulates as a person is exposed to repeated chronic stressor. Um, and so there are indicators for this that can be measured in the blood, actually. So, um, for instance, blood levels of cortisol, C-reactive protein, hemoglobin A1C, and other uh, physical measurements like blood pressure. So just to give um, a, a concrete example, um, so this graph is um, from uh, an American study, um, and basically, um, the, the point of this slide is really to show that black and many racialized women carry the burden of stress caused by both gender and racial discrimination. And so in the study where they measured biological indicators for chronic stress or allostatic load, uh, when you compare, so they compared black women and men, so those are the two top ones there, um, and white women and men, uh, it seems that black women um, demonstrated that they bore the greatest burden um, as shown in the graph. So they're, they're at the top and second to that is black men. And so there appears to be a greater stress burden of racialized women who are experiencing both systemic sexism and racism. Uh, so in the, the, um, in the paper they called it double jeopardy. And so um, the bottom line here is systemic racism works as a chronic stressor and racialized women appear to have the greatest physiologic response to that stress. So um, briefly, how does it also work as uh, in the indirect category? And as I mentioned, the indirect category is really the person who might not perceive stress from racism. Perhaps they grew up in another country, perhaps they're not noticing it. It's actually not stressing them out. Or they have really good coping mechanisms, they're meditating, they're eating well, they go for a jog. Um, but nonetheless, um, 
income and the labor market are racialized in this country so that whether or not it's perceived as a stress, unfortunately, um, you are more likely to be in a lower income situation if you are racialized. And so there's this experience of unearned disadvantage that people have, um, and as we know, that's simply by itself a social determinant of health. Again, to give another example from Canadian data, so according to a study by the Wellesley Institute using 2006 data, um, and there's a lot on here, but I've kind of zoomed in on the main thing, they compared immigrants to immigrants in this study, and they looked at second generation and third generation. So they looked at non-racialized or uh, white um, immigrants and racialized immigrants so that they could kind of control for that assumption that it's all about acculturation and getting used to the country. That's why people's incomes are lower. And so what you can see here, what I've highlighted for you here, is that a racialized woman on average um, makes less than half of, sorry, not just a racialized, a racialized immigrant woman makes half of what a racialized, uh, sorry, a non-racialized immigrant man would make, so a white immigrant. So that's a pretty significant gap, and it persists into second generation for those who were born here. And so you've got to kind of imagine, think about your clients, right, somebody who's racialized. That means either she's going to work twice as hard, that's a mantra that's very common in, um, in racialized and immigrant groups, you work twice as hard. But what happens when she's pregnant and working twice as hard? Let's say she decides not to work twice as hard, she's at peace with where she is, so you know, there's a saying, you cut your, your cloth according to your size. Well, that means that she might be living in a condition where she cannot afford the right nutrition or live in a healthy environment for, uh, for herself and her unborn child. And so that is going to have an impact on health. Again, regardless of whether or not the person recognizes it as a stressor due to, due to race. So again, that's why I separate them because the indirect is the being more likely to live in poverty, which we know is a social determinant of health, but the direct one where it's a chronic stressor, well, we see that even when you control for socioeconomic status. So even a rich racialized person can have um, the health effects of racism. Okay, so now to go into maternal health. You guys are the experts here on maternal health, so I'm briefly touching upon this because I wanted to kind of address, you know, what you might be seeing uh, in your everyday work. And so there are also studies demonstrating that the increased stress and poor living conditions experienced by racialized groups um, seem to manifest themselves um, during a most vulnerable time in a person's life, right? So uh, that would be during pregnancy, potentially affecting the next generation. So in the United States, numerous studies have demonstrated that African-American women have poorer birth outcomes than the white population, even when you control for socioeconomic status. In Canada, Indigenous babies have twice the mortality of non-Indigenous babies. Black Canadian women have a higher incidence of lower birth weight babies and preterm births, both, as you know, are associated with poorer outcomes. Now, what's interesting is this doesn't just apply to women from historically disadvantaged groups. Um, across North America. It can also happen when there's a sudden incident leading to a rise in systemic discrimination or systemic racism. So for instance, in the six months following the September 11th attacks in California, Muslim moms with Arabic sounding, um, with babies with Arabic sounding names, that's how they identify the Muslim mothers, were 34% more likely to have a low birth weight baby compared to the year before. So prior to that, the birth weights were actually the same as, as the white American population, but after September 11th, those women were 34% more likely to have low birth weight babies, um, and compared to babies born to non-Muslim women. So it's not the September 11th attack in itself. For non-Muslim women, their babies, there was, there was no change. Um, in the same vein, in 2008, when Latino people were the target of immigration raids um, in Iowa, months later, there was a 24% increase in Latina women in that area having low birth weight babies. And I draw your attention where they, um, it shows uh, before and after, so the gray is before, the red is after, but it also shows uh, it didn't matter whether or not they were foreign born or uh, born in the United States. In fact, it, it, was, it was much uh, more significant if they were born in the United States. So it wasn't themselves being the fear of being deported, it was the, the living in an environment where there was systemic racism.
Now that being said though, I want to take a moment also to talk about community resilience and the studies that are actually showing um, different factors that lead to resilience and that reduce allostatic load, not just um, in the present time, but where they follow people for years. And overall, the message seems like actually uh, that saying that it takes a village to raise a child um, is quite true when it comes to stress and resilience and all of that because, um, so let's say for this study, oh, I can't point really, but at the top, effects of coping style, it's shown that actually, um, so this study looked at people who are in a heart uh, study in the United States and basically um, their conclusion was that they looked at people who had different coping styles when dealing with racism and actually um, allostatic load on average was lower for the people whose coping style was to address it, particularly black women. So ignoring it um, didn't lead to better outcomes, but addressing it or speaking up did. And so we think about communities that actually start to advocate and speak up about issues, well that um, is shown to, to reduce allostatic load. In resilience to adversity, that study was really interesting because what they looked at, first of all, they compared children who had um, a nurturing family environment and had that village, they had a lower allostatic load. But actually there are interventions that one can do to help um, these young people who might be at risk of you know, adverse outcomes and train their parents so that over time, those kids also show a lower allostatic load and have better resilience. So, whether you're born in a village or we have interventions to create that village, people have better outcomes. And maternal and uh, pediatric health, this study over here was really interesting at demonstrating how um, basically uh, the, the biopsychosocial environment really does matter for the child and really uh, the, the caregiving environment is key, not only in their stress levels, but actually in gene expression. So not changing their DNA, but in gene expression and epigenetics. Um, and so there are things that communities do, but this slide does not articulate and capture what really happens in communities that face these types of adversities. All of the numbers that I've given you so far talking about disparities, I really want you to remember that those numbers would actually be so much higher if it wasn't for the everyday heroes in those communities. If it wasn't for the amazing resilience of those communities, I, ha I have no idea what, how high those numbers would be. It's just that that is understudied. But for the moms and the dads and the aunties and the grandmas who help and sustain and really um, support um, other moms and babies and, and teachers who step in, um, those are the everyday unsung heroes and we're not measuring that, but it's a beautiful resilience. And so we need to understand that these are communities that are thriving, that are having resilience despite living in a, a situation of oppression. So aside from what goes on in the communities, what can we also do particularly as healthcare providers um, about systemic racism? So one interesting thing is the definition of systemic racism has now been redefined by a health research organization, the Wellesley Institute, and then there's the CEO, Dr. Kwame McKenzie. Um, uh, and they've redefined institutional systemic racism and they've redefined it as a call to action. So it's a call to action for all of us. Uh, and so they state that institutional racism is an ecological form of discrimination. What does that mean? It means discrimination is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's not even a question. It is part of our ecology here in Canada. And it refers to inequitable outcomes for different racialized groups. So there's the emphasis on different, different racialized groups. And it is occurring where there is a lack of effective action by an organization or organizations to eradicate those equitable outcomes. So in other words, institutional racism is seeing racial disparities and doing nothing effective about them. So it's a call to action. So really I say uh, to you know, my colleagues, if, if ye seek, and I didn't say he, ye, if ye seek, then ye will find, and ye should do something about it, all right? So how do we do something about it? Well, if you're how are you going to find it if you don't measure it, really? And so uh, this is an example of how we start to identify disparities in healthcare in Canada. And so Toronto hospitals and clinics are collecting uh, health equity data, uh, including race and ethnicity, but also um, income and sexual orientation at point of care. 
Now I can say it's not perfect, but uh, you can even check out the website, torontohealthequity.ca. They've got, um, they put up all of their questionnaires, but also there's training available online. But when you enter a hospital in downtown Toronto, they explain that they're asking because they care. The model is we ask because we care. And so people are actually filling this out. There was a lot of hesitance on the part of healthcare providers to ask this kind of information, even though we ask people all kinds of sensitive information all of the time uh, about their sexual history, for instance, but uncomfortable asking about income, well, it can be done and it's being done fairly well there. Um, we also need to advocate for institutional change. So this, these are institutional cultures. These are things happening um, not just at the individual level. So we need our institutions to provide training, cultural safety training, anti-oppression training, which I understand this organization has engaged in, anti-racism, implicit bias, or even staff engagement on how to be an ally. Now, what about individual responsibility? Of course, there's a role to play in, so how many people have heard of the implicit association test for unconscious bias? Right, so, so a few people have heard about it. So it's, um, uh, you know, um, strongly demonstrated test to measure uh, relative strength of association between pairs and identify implicit biases, not just about race, but also gender, sexual orientation, uh, national origin, etc. And so, um, but a, there's been a lot of studies since that time and systematic reviews showing that it doesn't fully change behaviors. Now, why is that? Because it's in our unconscious. It's not our, our, our explicit values, right? This is in our unconscious. But I would still recommend doing these types of tests because I think in an organization or in a clinic, it helps people realize that, wait, I actually do have biases. And then creates a situation where people can engage in you know, adopting policies and procedures and protocols, which people don't usually like, but policies and procedures and protocols within a group or inst institution that apply um, forms like trauma-informed care. So as I spoke about racism as a form of trauma, so a way that, mean, of, you know, for instance, maintaining communication that is consistent, open, respectful, and compassionate, uh, being aware of how an individual's culture or their community's culture affects how they perceive trauma, safety, and privacy. But overall, trying to move everyone from um, a healthcare perspective, uh, particularly for what we call, quote unquote, the difficult patient um, or client, from what's wrong with you to what happened to you or what happened to your community, and coming from a, a space and place of understanding, even if that has to happen initially through checklists and protocols, um, sometimes creating institutional change does require uh, policies and procedures like that. So in conclusion, I do want to say, and I would like you to leave really with this uh, key message that as a Canadian village, we really need to stop pathologizing communities, okay? Um, we cannot be focused on fixing communities. Uh, it's deficit focused. It's, uh, it can be damaging actually to those communities. And ultimately, it's not treating the root problem. It's not treating the disease. And so um, we need to start thinking about racism. We need to start pathologizing those systems that we have, like systemic racism, like colonization, um, and other forms of syste systemic discrimination. And to do that, yes, we, we do need to speak with different communities um, and, and understand the history of different communities and understand the experiences, the lived experiences now of people from those communities because that's how we get our, our clinical history to understand it better. But the other piece is we need our labs and our labs is the collection of data in collaboration and in solidarity with communities to know where the disparities are so that we can take action and start to address it. So collectively, in solidarity, uh, we can be part, ideally, over time, in long-lasting, meaningful change that can result in true healing collectively over time. And so with that, I leave you. Midwives, Quenu. Again, again, midwives, Quenu. Hey! All right, thank you for having me.